Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is a Sunday garden question and answer that's going to be on a Wednesday. I hadn't done uh, these uh, Sunday Q&As for a while, and when I did the first one two weeks ago, there were just a ton of questions. And so uh, I went back to that video and got a few more off of it. And so I'm doing an extra Q&A video. Uh, then I'm going to do one on Sunday. So you can ask questions down below this video, and uh, I'll pull from the Sunday one I just did and this one for this coming Sunday, and then I'll just do them every Sunday from here on. But there were, like I say, there were lots of good questions from the video two weeks ago. Holly is right here behind me uh, laying down. Um, uh, I don't know how many, I, I said the other day, I don't know how many videos she's actually uh, actually been in on this channel. There's a thousand videos and I would, it wouldn't surprise me if she's been in 400 plus of them. If you go back to the oldest videos I did at my nursery, uh, just on individual plant videos, uh, she photobombed almost all of those. She would be running behind me, uh, chasing after something. Uh, she she herded rabbits uh, at the uh, at the nursery while the nursery was still open. Okay, so uh, let's get started uh, on some of those. Again, these were questions from a week and a half ago. Uh, I get a lot of questions about Shasta daisies. I've got um, a group of uh, uh, a newer variety over here called Real Charmer um, that's beautiful. It's Leucanthemum uh, Real Charmer or Shasta, you know, it's a Shasta Daisy hybrid. Uh, and a lot of people struggle with them. You know, like the first year you put them in the ground, they come up, they bloom great. And then the second year, they can you can start to lose some of them. If you don't have moles or voles, which obviously is is is, is some sort, it, it couldn't be it could be an issue. Moles don't cause damage to our plants, but they can. Uh, create tunneling, which then are used by voles, uh, which do do damage to the roots on some of our uh, perennials and shrubs and even trees. I had a mag, I had a little gem magnolia at my old house that was probably 20 feet tall, and it started losing leaves uh, at one point, and uh, it was voles had done damage to the roots. That had a caliper maybe five six inches around, and uh, voles had done enough damage to it to uh, to hurt it, but. Uh, if it's not that, and I don't think that's what it is, it's probably just crowding. Shasta daisies are just notorious for number one being water hogs because they overcrowd one another. And, um, you know, they can almost, they, it's almost like an attack uh, on each other. I think they need to be divided more frequently than other things. So if you're, if you're losing some of them, if you're having to water them very, very frequently, uh, it's probably best to go in with a shovel, uh, dig them up and, and chop them uh, into a, uh, into other pieces, give some of them away, that kind of thing. Uh, you can even you can do that during the summer, not in not in the middle of the day when it's 110 degrees, but you can pop them out of the ground. You can cut them in half, pop them out of the ground, chop them, put them in containers uh, if you want to root them into containers temporarily, or put them right back into the ground. Just do it in the evening and make sure you cut them back some. Uh, let's see. Somebody asked me if I like compost as mulch. Uh, compost makes great mulch. Uh, the problem is it doesn't stay in place. And so I've got a neighbor, uh, had all kinds of driveway work done uh, right up the street from me. Uh, and then some landscapers came in and put about four or five inches of compost on the entire yard. I think they're coming back in the fall to actually do all the planting work. But in the meantime, the compost is everywhere. It's in his driveway, it's in the road, it's, it's just absolutely everywhere. So uh, if you have any kind of slope, if you have any kind of spot where uh, water is going to be an issue, then compost doesn't make a very good mulch. Uh, you, you know, you're ranking mulches by how they move around. Obviously, a uh, rock would probably move around the least. Um, and it's not something I would ever recommend, uh, if you're not, unless you're in the western part of the country. Uh, but in the eastern part of the country, I call that, I always call it gravel regret. Here in the east where we get a lot of rain, once you start getting weeds and stuff in the gravel, uh, it's kind of a pain to uh, keep clean. And so, although it moves the least, um, it's the, ultimately the biggest pain. Uh, number two is pine straw. You know, if you're on some sort of slope and uh, uh, pine straw wraps, you know, kind of interlocks in itself and uh, stays in place pretty well if pine straw is available to you. I don't know why I started talking about mulches in terms of staying in place. Um, and then uh, triple shredded hardwood uh, is what I used here. It does a pretty good job of locking itself uh, onto itself as well. And then the least, uh, uh, the worst are going to be pine barks. And so like pine bark soil conditioner, which I love to incorporate some into this clay and into my containers and all the nursery businesses use, use pine bark soil conditioner. Pine bark soil conditioner, mini nuggets, nuggets, and compost are all like things that just float. 
And so uh, if you get a lot of rainfall, um, that's the reason I don't think they're very good. Um, but again, absolutely nothing wrong with it as a mulch other than, I, I promise you, it will be a lot of cleanup and, and work. Okay, um, somebody asked me if they should plant their conifer seedlings uh, in the summer or pot them up. I guess they had done some, uh, 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 again, some seedlings from some conifers that they had and wanted to know whether they would go ahead and put them in the ground. I definitely wouldn't. I'd definitely put them into a container and uh, get them rooted out into a container and then put them in in the fall. Uh, if you wanted to, you could even overwinter them in the container and then put them in in the spring. So but just give them some time um, before you put them in the uh, before you put them in the uh, in the ground. I think that uh, these kind of temperatures we have in midsummer would definitely uh, would definitely stress them out. Uh, somebody asked me about their plants flopping. So things like salvias and sedums are flopping quite a bit. And obviously anybody that hears me say that question out loud is going to say they don't get enough sunlight. And that's what I'm assuming. Uh, they're not getting quite as much sun as maybe even they think they get. Um, I had that a lot when I was doing retail. You know, people have no idea how much sun or shade they actually get. Uh, you know, maybe the time that they're outside enjoying it, it's full of sun, but then some portion of the day it's not. That's usually the issue if your plants are uh, stretching. Um, salvias can just be cut in half, you know, midsummer, and uh, and that will thicken them up and and I'll get a second round of flowers on them super fast. You can do the same thing on sedum, but it may be a little late at this point. So like autumn joy sedum, we're talking about the fall blooming sedums. Uh, the ground cover sedums, you can, I think you can put a lawn mower on those and, uh, and not hurt them. But uh, the uh, uh, like autumn joy sedum, which blooms in the fall, you know, by the time we get to fall, sometimes they can be this big and 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 super thick and then flop uh, as we get toward fall. But you can cut those like in June. Uh, every year you can cut them in half and that will um, that still gives you plenty of time for them to flower in the fall and thicken up a little bit so that might be a strategy you would use but again I lean toward it probably doesn't get quite enough sunlight to keep them compact uh, all season okay um, somebody asked me if foliar feeding their plants is effective and what kind of strength uh, you would use and I don't know what kind of fertilizer you're using I don't know if you're using you know, miracle grow, or you're using um, fish emulsion, you know, two, two very different uh, things. Uh, we did a little bit of foliar feeding uh, at the nursery, and we would use a very low rate, and we would use something like fish emulsion. Um, and we, you know, whatever other chemical application or whatever chem applications we were using, we would put a small amount of foliar fertilizer uh, into it at the same time. Uh, I don't... I just don't fertilize things that much. And so um, I don't do it here at all. I, I don't have any, um, I don't push these plants. I mean, you guys are probably looking at this thinking I'm pushing this stuff like crazy and I'm just not. I did a lot of soil prep uh, and, uh, but they're for the most part being left to fend, fend for themselves. I think you end up with a lot. Yes, you can foliar your feed. Yes, I would use a low rate. Uh, don't over fertilize things. You're gonna invite pests. Uh, into uh, into your landscape. A lot of the pest problems that I experienced in a nursery were related to the fact that we were over fertilizing things. And so I'm putting something in a container uh, on May 15th, because we're so busy in the spring, we start doing our crazy potting. Late May, June, July, we're crazy potting. And we gotta get this stuff, enough growth on it before it goes to sleep in the fall that it's ready for next spring sales. So you're pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. And the more you push it, the more insect problems you get, the more the more problems you get, just in general. The more pruning you got to do on it, the more maintenance you have to do on it, uh, and again, it invites pests. So, uh, but in the nursery business, you got no choice. But in the in the in the in your landscape, I don't I don't see any real reason to be pushing things um, uh, the way a lot of people are promoting to you that you should be pushing things where they want to sell you something. Uh, let's see. Um, Somebody wanted to know if there were rose varieties that um, did well with just evening sun only. Some climbers, um, you know, will take a little bit uh, less sun uh, than, than others. But I think if you, if you have an area that's not getting light until late in the day, that roses just may not be um, for you. Roses are just not for me anyway. Um, I've got one ground cover rose uh, back here that It's a Breeze rose that Southern Living has. Super low maintenance rose. Um, I have done nothing to it since it went in the ground except for pruning it a couple times. That's my kind of rose. Uh, I'm, I'm not a, uh, 
I've never been a giant rose fan. I mean, one of the things about uh, this landscape, as detailed as it is, 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 as it is becoming, it's not anywhere near finished. Uh, but most of the things here are actually very low maintenance. It would probably look to people like this would just be crazy maintenance, but I go for low maintenance. And so uh, putting a plant in the ground that's going to cause me all kinds of problems. And now, so, and I say that because if you put a rose in a low light situation, the environment will try to dispose of it um, pretty quickly. So uh, just keep that in mind. There might be probably better alternatives to flowering things um, that are get more limited light. Okay. Uh, somebody asked me um, about they had just new. They have a newly sodded space. The turf that I have out here is this Zeon zoysia that you see in the videos, uh, and how to go about watering it. If you um, sod in the summer, what I would always do is I would drown that space. I mean, really, really drown it one time and then keep your foot traffic off of it as much as possible. Once you start pulling this, you can start pulling the edges of the sod back and see when you're starting to get some roots. Once you start getting some attachment to the ground, you can back off uh, on that watering uh, pretty quickly. And then um, I think the first month, you're probably going to want to give it a couple inches a week and then you want to wean it back to you know, an inch a week or, or an inch and a half a week as fast as, as fast as you can. Hopefully you're in an area that's getting some, getting some rainfall to help out with that. But like anything else, um, I'll initially drown it uh, just to try to you know, make sure that I'm um, compacting the soil down, make sure I'm getting rid of all the air pockets that are under the side, even if I rolled it in place and that kind of thing. Once I've done that process, I want to wean the water back uh, as quickly as possible. But you can come back, you can come in, pull a corner back, uh, see if you, uh, um, you know, see if it needs water. And if it does, you know, give it, give it a heavy watering. What you'll, what you're going to find on your sod normally is your, um, your edges are what's going to dry out. So, you, you know, when you first lay the sod, you can see all the edges down. Sometimes it's best to just take a water hose uh, and uh, wet those edges. Uh, keep those edges wet because that's where your shrinking will happen too. So your sod is uh, butted up, you know, that's rolled out and butted up to each other. When the when those pieces uh, when those pieces left the farm, they may have been like 18 inches wide exactly. Like the machine cut them exactly 18 inches wide. By the time they got handled and everything by the person doing the work, they might be 18 and a half inches wide. You know, because they stretch. You know, everything stretched stretched out a little bit. As if you let it get too dry, those pieces of sod can shrink a little bit and then leave you gaps in between the uh, pieces. So don't let those edges dry out uh, ever. So and that, like I say, you, you may get hot spots in it. I'm answering a long, long answer for watering sod. Uh, you may just find that there's a couple little pockets that are drying out more than others that you have to water and you can just do that by hand uh, in the evening. But uh, wean it off as fast as possible. Okay, let's see. Um, Somebody asked me if they could plant limbs from a butterfly bush when they cut it back. Uh, it's easier to just root it in some sort of soil. Butterfly bushes root super easy. I'm gonna, my propagation videos will start next week. And uh, if you want to follow along with that, butterfly bushes are super, super easy uh, to root. Yes, you can just probably take a piece of a butterfly bush and stick it in the ground as long as the ground stays moist and, you know, the air is not above the ground. It's not super, super dry like in a, you know, Arizona or something like that, uh, you can probably get away with it. So it's humid outside here in my area most afternoons and the soil, as long as the soil was a little bit moist but not wet, you could probably root something directly in the ground. I'll take tomato suckers and just pull back a spot in the garden and stick them right in the ground and, and get them to root. They'll initially wilt like crazy, but then they'll root in uh, and create new tomato plants that way. Um, but again, it's easier. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll show you in the next week. Uh, that's just easier to stick them in a uh, stick them in some soil, keep them moist for a week or so, and butterfly bushes will be rooted in ten days um, uh, that way. Okay. Um, somebody asked, I guess when I had the drone up uh, on one of the uh, drone videos, that there's a blue green uh, plant out by the road that they wanted to know what it was. I have a Shasta viburnum out there and it might be that Shasta viburnum you're seeing from the uh, drone video. I've done two tour videos in the front in the last week and a half. The third one I'm doing tomorrow and uh, it will be that area. So whatever that plant is, you'll, you'll know tomorrow or, or the next day. 
Um, somebody asked me if euphorbia are sensitive to water. Yes, if you're killing euphorbia, generally speaking, that's water uh, related. Um, I see more and more euphorbia being used, new interesting varieties being used in the landscape. Those of us who have clay soils, we definitely need to mound euphorbia up uh, because that's the one thing, uh, that's the one thing that will uh, get them every time. I see them mostly, the best ones I see are in containers and in raised beds or raised sloped spaces. Uh, that's where I see euphorbia doing the best here in my area. Uh, but there are lots of new really cool euphor euphorbs now that um you know I, I don't have any in this landscape so far but I, I will eventually this lot is super flat and so uh you know i almost have to create contour for something like that or just really leave it up above of the soil when i plant it so i'll do about three more here before i wrap this one up somebody um all my dahlias are over here uh, looking great somebody asked about their dahlias having chlorosis uh meaning that you can kind of see the veins uh, in the leaves and there's some yellowing off color in between the uh, in between the veins that's usually an iron deficiency they've used iron tone uh, on them to try to correct it you can't necessarily cor correct chlorosis with a direct application of iron uh, iron you probably have enough iron in your soil typically uh, most people do uh, but the pH uh, when the pH is off though uh, that's when plants Plants can't use the iron that's already in the soil. So if your pH is over 7, uh, frequently that's where we're going to see uh, chlorosis uh, in our plants. When the pH is below 6.5, you know, down to 6, especially down to 5, that's when our plants are, tend to be rich, super rich and dark green. Uh, the plant, plants that are heavy iron feeders. Um, and uh, so frequently the iron is there and it's your pH that's off. So I would check your pH. Uh, one thing that folks can do, and I've seen this many times, I talk about loving plants to death all the time by overwatering them, over fertilizing them. Uh, there's another thing you can do, which is um, put too much organic material uh, in your planting spaces. And so, you know, if you go and buy a giant bag of that, some sort of potting mix and dig a big giant hole and throw all the soil away that came out of the hole, the clay or the sand or whatever came out of the hole and use all this organic material, that organic material might have a high pH uh, and uh, you know something around seven. Compost typically does have a pH around seven and that can cause some of your uh, nutrient deficiencies. Um, there's nothing wrong with the soil. Uh, you know, I like to amend it a little bit because naturally soil is gonna have you know, eight to 10% organic material, something like that. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm putting into the uh, soil. But my clay soil, as much as I complain about it, that coloration in that orange clay is iron uh, and it keeps my plants rich and dark green. Um, you know, I amend it a little bit and I know that it can cause me issues from water, water related issues. But other than that, I'm not complaining about it because it keeps my plants looking great, rich, dark green. Uh, so check your pH if you're having chlorosis issues before you start with the ironite because, uh, you know, you may want to lower your pH. You can do that with sulfur or replanting your dahlias more directly into the soil. I don't know how they were planted. Uh, and then the other thing they had was uh, white fly issues. Keep in mind your insect issues um, are going to be worse on unhealthy plants. And so you may find that your white fly issue gets better uh, with an improvement in the condition of the plants. Um, so, you know, um, we won't know until you won't cure the chlorosis. Uh, let's see. Uh, somebody, uh, let's see. Somebody asked when they could repot their azaleas. They're in zone 10 in California. They've got them in containers, want to pot them into um, a, just a larger container. I would do that anytime. Container to container, I do anytime. And I think especially, um, you know, a lot of people won't want to plant. This hummingbird's just going to taunt me forever. Um, okay, so, uh, but I think when we're talking about repotting something from one pot to the other, I would do that in the peak of the summer. It wouldn't bother me at all. I wouldn't move something in the ground from one spot to another necessarily. Uh, I would, but I wouldn't recommend anybody else do it. Uh, but from one pot to the other, I think the plant will actually thank you. Uh, just don't do a tremendous amount of root damage in the process, but uh, the plant would probably thank you to have some additional soil, additional space uh, at the most stressful time of the season. Uh, let's see. Somebody, uh, their salvia gregii, they're in zone 7B, same as me. I think it was Atlanta or something. 
their salvia gregii aren't blooming here uh, in the middle of the summer. Um, they also had a question about propagating them. I'm going to propagate some salvia in a video next week, so you'll see how easy they are. I'm going to propagate several of these salvia. They literally take a week, a week and a half to, to, to get roots on them. But salvia gregii, the reason I, one of the reasons I have so many salvia varieties in this yard is you will find windows uh, where they bloom. My May night salvia that, you know, I love was perennial plant of the year years and years ago is a, basically a late spring blooming salvia for me. It doesn't really bloom uh, in the summer or, or the fall. My salvia gregii tend to bloom heavy, heaviest with slightly cooler nighttime temperatures. And so May, April and May, uh, and then again, they'll come back around and bloom heavily in September and October. Uh, other varieties that I have, annual varieties and other varieties like the heat, heat of the summer, the ones that are very marginal here, the ones that I put on the screen that are zone 8, zone 9, those are the ones that just bloom in the absolute heat of the summer. So part of the reason I have so many varieties uh, is because they tend to uh, peak bloom at different times. And so uh, uh, that's the reason for that. But my salvia gregii, same thing. They're... Um, I've got one directly across the lawn over here. It's got one, two, three flowers on it. I know that in the fall um, that it will come back around and bloom heavily again. So, uh, oh, and then one other quick thing. Uh, somebody had mentioned that they use chip drop. I talked about in the uh, Q&A about keeping the uh, ground cover, uh, the ground covered. That chipdrop.com uh, website is a good resource if you just want free wood chips. If you're starting a new project or something like that, and you just want to get the ground covered quickly. Um, uh, I use that. Um, I, I've used it before and I have recommended it uh, to many uh, people uh, as well. Just, you know, free wood chips um, to get the ground covered, let them break down for a little while, and uh, you can improve your soil a lot very quickly. Thank you guys for following along with these question and answer videos. Uh, ask questions down below. I'll be back on Sunday with one of these, and then I'm just going to get into the pattern of doing them uh, on Sundays. Thanks for watching. That thing just flew over my head.